The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone, to Nautel in uh, Hackett's Cove, Nova Scotia, along beautiful St. Margaret's Bay. We have a webinar to this afternoon um, talking about and explaining our NX series of 25 and 50 kilowatt AM transmitters. Um, I'm Chuck Kelly, and I'm delighted to have with me Mr. Jamin Barrett, the AM project leader. Good afternoon, Jamin. Good afternoon. We'll explain a little bit about the agenda that we're going to be going through this afternoon. We're going to go through an overview, a technical overview of the NX series, kind of get our hands on it inside. We're going to go through how the NX series deals with digital radio. We're going to talk about the very unique NX control functionality, the built-in web server. Then we're actually going to take you down live to a transmitter in our test room, and we're going to walk through the screens and let you see what we can really do with the transmitter, make it play. We're going to talk about how we support the NX series to, to keep that uh, legendary Nautel service and support level up. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this is our 40th anniversary of Nautel, the very first Nautel organization. Or the Nautel organization was first developed in 1969, and our first solid-state AM transmitters from Nautel were first uh, uh, introduced in 1972. It's worth pointing out, I think, that uh, Nautel has never produced a tube-type transmitter. And down in the lower right-hand corner, you can actually see our facility as it was in the 1970s along the shores of St. Margaret's Bay, where we are now. On the left-hand side here, this is the NX design engineering team. These are the engineers that created the NX series. It's interesting, I think, that Nautel is an engineering-led organization. We have 37 design engineers on staff. And this engineering talent is what brings us products like the NX series. On the right-hand side of the screen, all the little gold dots indicate the locations where Nautel transmitters are installed worldwide. We have three major product families. The brand new VS series operates from 300 watts to 2.5 kilowatts in a 300 watt, 1 kilowatt, 2.5 kilowatt versions. Um, new solid state FM transmitters. On the right hand side we have the NV series of FM transmitters which have models from 3.5 kilowatts to 88 kilowatts. Um, and we have the NX series, the subject of today's webinar of medium wave transmitter, transmitters or AM transmitters which operate from 25 kilowatts all the way through and up to 2 megawatts. So the models that we'll be talking about today are the NX25 and the NX50, but they have their big brothers, the NX100, 200, 300, 400, 800, and all the way up to 2 megawatts. And all of these product lines share one very important common feature, and that is the advanced user interface. We call it the AUI. And all of these transmitters have built-in web servers all these transmitters you can get access to incredible instrumentation and control via a web browser. So let's talk about the NX series. It has the industry's top efficiency of 90%. That's in the 50 kilowatt level. The 25, is that right? The 25 kilowatt transmitter is a little bit closer to 88% efficient. Yep. Okay. And the higher power transmitters are all 90%. That's correct. These transmitters also share some very innovative technology, which we'll go into in more detail, adaptive pre-correction, which linearizes the transmitter and is very, very powerful, not only for digital broadcasting like HD radio, but it also can make analog broadcasting much better as well. The, the transmitters include RF and audio spectrum analyzers. They operate at 2.79 mega samples per second in, in terms of how often they sample the audio. And, and this is really important for modulator bandwidth and, and linearity in the transmitter. They have an intuitive touchscreen interface, which you'll experience. They're ultra compact, very small. You can see here the specifications of the NX50. This is also the same size um, as the NX25. The NX25 actually is in the same box. And uh, you can see how very small. This is all there is. There's no other part to this transmitter, no other external transformer cabinets or anything like that. And the NX25 and the NX50, this is the actual size of the transmitter. That's right. It's quite small. Okay. Uh, looking also from a digital standpoint, 
All of the NX series transmitters are designed and optimized for HD radio, uh, also optimized for DRM for that matter, but uh, HD radio is in, in, in use in this hemisphere most of the time. This is how the NX series looks internally. Now, actually, these drawings are uh, NX100, so we'd only have 20 of these modules that are in here at the moment. These bottom 20 wouldn't be there if in the 50 kilowatt. And in the 20 kilowatt, you'd only have the top row of modules. That's correct. It leaves room to install the power transformer below the modules, um, and that's where the transformer would fit. Right. Up above here, you can see where the output network is located. And you can see here on the, on the back side, you can see the, where the capacitors are mounted for the output network. And then you can see the various power supply components in the back of the rack down here. And then the NX50 and 25, the power transformer itself is located in this area in the center of the back of the rack on the bottom. This is the block diagram of the NX50. Jamin, would you like to walk through that? Sure. Okay, so we'll just start with the audio inputs. Um, they're fed into the, con the main control card, which is the interface card as well as the um, as well as the well the interface card for the customers and and for the system itself. Attached to the interface card, the exciters are attached. Um, there's communication with the exciters and the other modules within the transmitter. Uh, those exciters will produce the PDM and the RF drive signals uh, that will drive the, the power modules. Also interfaced um, with the main interface card is the TCP IP web server control. So for your remote control, um, some of the things that we'll be showing you today, which include the uh, remote interface with the transmitter where you can view the AUI remotely, that is over that TCP IP connection. Uh, the, there is an optional GPS interface with the main card to allow you to lock your carrier frequency to a GPS source. Uh, so that is interfaced um, with the main control card as well. So if we follow on through the control card with the mod drive and the RF drive signals, those are distributed. Um, there are some buffer cards and those get distributed and transmitted or sent to the power modules over an RS-422 connection. The power modules themselves in an NX25, there would be 10. In an NX50, there would be 20, 2.5 kilowatt broadband power modules. Those power modules are then combined via a series combiner. Um, any power module that is to be disabled or brought out of service um, is do done so by um, shorting out a relay in that series combiner. So um, those are hot pluggable. They are hot pluggable. So live, you can disable a module and remove it and, and reinstall another. Um, the series combiner is then um, used to feed the output mashing network and the, um, the filtering for the harmonics. Um, that is a dual T output network um, with a shunt a third harmonic notch in the second T. As far as the power, sub power for the system, the AC power, there is a mains transformer. The secondary of the transformer is a, a phase controller which is used for um, slowly phasing up on turn on to eliminate as much of the um, inrush as possible. Um, from there, there is a choke input filter. So there's a choke with a reservoir capacitor bank, which you saw earlier, and you'll see some more pictures of soon. Um, and that is used to generate our 400 volt bus. So one interesting thing that we can do because of the phase controlling um, is we can allow for a very broad range of um, AC inputs without damage to the transmitter, much more than the traditional plus or minus 10%. Um, we're comfortable with plus or minus 30%. So there's a much broader range of, uh, of AC inputs that can be tolerated by our system. Something else I will just point out quickly is the low voltage power supplies, the RF drive, the fan, the controller power supplies. Those are all off the secondary of the mains transformer, which again provides isolation from uh, any transients that mains might incur at the site, um, yielding a much more reliable, robust operation. And they are all redundant. All of the low voltage power and supplies are redundant. And auto switching, that's correct. OK, very good. Let's talk about dynamic pre-correction. I mean, the NX series of AM transmitters are the first high power AM transmitters to be provided with dynamic pre-correction. And this technology basically takes a sample of the RF output power via a directional coupler and brings it back through an analog to digital converter and then basically compares it with what hypothetical or, or, or theoretical that a performance uh, should be, and then creates an error signal, which then pre-distorts pre the system. Is that basically correct? That's basically correct. Um, so I, I like to point out, before we get too much into the pre-correction, pre um, about some of the benefits of the NX, that we focus so much on trying to make the system so that you didn't need any of this pre-correction. 
Um, so the system is very very linear and has very good performance without any of the pre-correction thrown into the mix. Um, but then we start to look at the pre-correction and, and like Chuck just said, there is a directional coupler so we've got voltage and current samples that we can then use to do things to compare against the ideal signal, whether it's the envelope. So when we're thinking of the modulator, modulator bandwidth is a very important part of trying to get good digital operation. Um, and in order to get that good digital operation to get recomb recombination, you need a very flat response throughout the modulator bandwidth. Um, so what we can do is we take samples of the signal and we know what the level is supposed to be and if it's, if it's being attenuated, we can actually boost it. Or if it's being boosted somewhat, we can attenuate it. And the same thing with the group delay when it comes to the envelope equalization. If there is a group delay that's getting applied so the signal is getting delayed at higher frequencies, we can then insert um, an advance to get rid of that and, and try and get a flat response as far as um, group delay and spectrum. And then the same thing for the AM to AM and AM to PM correction. We look at when we expect to be putting out a certain signal, um, whether it be a sine wave or whatever the signal is that's getting generated, uh, we can automatically check or continually check to make sure that that signal is um, accurate in order to generate a lookup table that will, um, that will be able to uh, correct for any nonlinearity that might be present in the system and, and some nonlinearity that can be introduced through the load itself. And then the AM to the PM, the third form of correction is very similar to the AM to AM, except now we're correcting for phase nonlinearity that is often, majority of it is caused by Miller effect on the, on the FETs, the capacity um, from the gate to the source and gate to the drain that is variable with the AM or the, the, um, the voltage level across the drain to source. Okay, let's see how this looks. So an ideal system would be a straight line here between the input down here and the output over here. In a nonlinear system, you might have a nonlinearity that looks like this. And, and what this transmitter is going to do is create a mirror image of that nonlinearity and, and pre-distort the signal at the, in the exciter to create that type of signal so that the output signal is linear. Is that about right? That is. That's exactly right. So you, and you'll see in some of the following slides exactly how that applies to various forms of correction. But I think in this next slide, we see a picture of well, we're first going to see the AM to AM. So in this case, we insert, um, you'll see um, at the bottom end, we, we have to insert some gain in order to, um, in order to get rid of the pinch-off effect. Um, we call, used to call that uh, PWM or PDM nipple. Yeah, and, and that's exactly, you see a little um, pinch-off at the trough of modulation. So at the very, very bottom end, you can see a little bit of gain to get rid of that. But also, along with the nipple, there's usually a point at which there's too much signal. Mm -hmm. So the pinch off, and, and you can see we, we're actually attenuating the signal at lower, at lower um, amplitudes mm -hmm. in order to try and clear that nipple up entirely. Okay. And this is what the end result is. No PWM nipple, no visible distortion at all in the trough with the AM to AM correction. That's right. It's beyond the ability um, to even measure distortion. Most devices can't measure down to these levels. It's below 0.1% distortion. Um, so it's kind of beyond the measure, measurement capabilities. Okay. And then this is the AM to PM distortion. So you're, you're looking at the envelope voltage on this axis and the phase correction on this axis. That's correct. So you can see the, the, the significant phase response at low envelope, volt, at low voltages. So at low voltages, there's a significant response. And this is the Miller effect. So if you look at a capacitor, or sorry, uh, at one of the transit fat data sheets, you'll see at the bottom end of voltage, there's a significant difference in the capacity, and that's what this is correcting for. And, and how, is that, um, how is that visible to the user? They don't, they don't see phase correction by itself, but what, what's the effect, the tangible effect to the, to the broadcaster? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, the phase correction, uh, when it's regular AM broadcast, the actual phase isn't that important um, because the phase content doesn't matter. You're just envelope detecting. When you start to do things that go beyond that, you know, for example, IBOC or HD operation um, or DRM or even um, stereo operation, the phase term now carries information. And if you change the phase term, uh, you will lose information. Um, it can result in out-of-band spectral regrowth um, or can result in additional errors in the signal when it's a digital signal. Or in the event where I mentioned a moment ago, um, for stereo operation, it could result in in poor stereo separation. Okay, very good. So the idea here is to produce a very high accuracy signal, and one of the ways that people might see that is in a 
an eye box situation, the receiver might lock earlier, quicker, and it might keep a lock longer in a noisy environment. That's correct, and that ties into something we'll be talking about a little bit later, but this is definitely a big part of that. Okay, and then this is the modulator response, and if I understand this correctly, um, the modulator filter response is this, the equalizer is that, and the composite result is a very, very flat line, almost 80 kilohertz. You can see the goal there, and that's uh, slightly dated in that our, our, our now goal is we around 65 kilohertz we roll off the signal, but the, the premise of it is correct in that we're trying to get a flat magnitude response right out to, in this case, 65 kilohertz. Looks textbook to me. All right, this is the group delay response, same exact idea. That's right. We're trying to get it to the place where there is no group to delay. So it becomes very important, again, with digital or DRM operation to reduce that out-of-band spectral regrowth um, to allow the mag and phase paths to um, recombine appropriately, and this, this does that. Okay. Let's talk about antenna considerations. You know, sometimes we as broadcast engineers look at the antenna like a 50 ohm load, but it's not. It rarely is that. And, and to the extent that it is a tuned circuit, uh, in combination with the uh, radiation resistance and other resistances, um, we have to look at this thing as a complex circuit, hence the Smith chart. That's right, it, and it's important to note that um, this transmitter is making a lot of steps towards uh, making improvements to allow us to better understand what is happening with antennas, but it still is important that some work is invested into getting the antenna set up appropriately to make the most of the transmitter. Um, so the transmitter gives you tools that allow you to help do that better. Um, but as before, it still is important to try and get that cusp oriented to the, to the right position. Um, and, and you can see on the bottom there, the cusp orientation, the, the appropriate orientation um, as far as textbooks is concerned is oriented to the 9 o'clock or to a parallel tuned load. Um, because we are a voltage source, voltage sources drive parallel tuned loads. Um, that's the best load for them. Okay. The and that's what, this is the reason why there's a real-time network analyzer built into the transmitter. That's right, and we'll talk about that more and we'll demonstrate it, but one neat thing I'd like to point out about, out about the network analyzer in the front of the transmitter is it is what the impedance looks like at the PA. So no more calculating what is the delay through the filter in the transmitter. When you look at the network analyzer, it tells you what the impedance that the PA is seeing is, and that way that is the important impedance to observe. Um, and you can make adjustments to get that, that cusp right, right at the PA. Great. All right, let's talk about the control card. This is, this is pretty much the central point in the entire unit. All the audio comes in here, the exciters plug in over here, remote con or the outputs of the PDM and the RF drive are over here somewhere, and remote control card is over here. That's right. So pretty, pretty powerful card. Yeah, so just take a quick step through it. Um, along the top right there, you can see the AES connectors. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the, the means for feeding in either the AES EBU style. I should have called them XLR connectors because that's what they are. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where you feed the AES EBU inputs or the analog left plus right, so standard analog XLR type of connection. And then the I and Q inputs can feed through right. on the AES ports. Right. Um, <coughs> Along the bottom of the card, you'll see four 25-pin D-subs. That's where, where the exciters will interface mm -hmm. with, the, mm -hmm. with the card. As Chuck said, on the left side, you see a whole bunch of RJ45-style connectors. It's hard to tell from there, but those are rj 45 That's where we feed the RF drive and the um, PDM signals to drive the modules. Um, on the far right of the card, you'll see two interface ports, um, D-subs, and those are used for the remote interface so that's the card that we often would suggest that you set up as your backup remote control or even backup local control and monitoring of the transmitter in the event that you're doing service for the AUI or, or so on. And there's even some basic start, stop, uh, raise, lower switches right there built onto the main That's telephone. right. There's some basic buttons to turn the transmitter on and off, switch local remote control, change right. exciters, and so on right on the controller. Okay. Very good. Um, these are the DSP our, uh, uh, exciters, direct digital uh, system uh, synthesis, I guess that is, EDS. And, and this is an FPGA, I guess? Yeah, that's the FPGA. So we've got an FPGA and a DSP on the card. And, and this really is the brains of the transmitter. Um, coming out of this card is all the signaling that you need to, to drive the transmitter. And really from there, the rest of the transmitter is just producing power from it. So this is like the CPU in the, in the computer, except maybe even a step beyond. 
Um, so this is really the heart of the operation. How many potentiometers and variable capacitors and gimmick capacitors and things are on this thing? Well, it's a, there's not a single one. Okay. And, and it's interesting because we were able to get to the place where there aren't, um, which makes it very easy for us to configure. That makes it serve. a very, very broad-banded exciter, too. Is this the same exciter we use in the long wave version of the transmitter? It, it is a very, very similar exciter in the long wave. Mm -hmm. um, the, there is one minor change um, for the FPGA, mm -hmm. um, but that same FPGA that we use in the long wave is going to be backwards compatible for the AM. Um, so we, we just need a little more space for the long wave for certain for certain things that we, okay. we do. So this card not only creates the RF drive signal and the PDM drive signals, but it also does the adaptive transmitter linearization. So it brings back the RF samples for the current and the voltage in the RF domain and analyzes those. And it does some very special mathematical computing, which allows it to um, actually increase the RMS power that you would get in a digital mode, like HD radio or, or DRM, um, higher than what other people might be able to do. That's right. It does some unique things. The card does a lot of stuff, whether it be taking the current and voltage and, and using those for the network or the spectrum analyzer displays developing the AM to AM, AM to PM, envelope equalization, all of those new kind of novel things that are done, they're, they're done in this card. So a lot of good hard work was put into this development. And this also has the capability of doing some equalization for antenna bandwidth issues. That's correct. And that goes back into the envelope equalization. What we can do when, when the antenna bandwidth has certain limitations, we can use the envelope equalization to adjust the um, the same thing as uh, we were talking about earlier, the response through the modulator as well as with both the envelope and the group delay. So if, if, a, if, a, if a chief engineer out there has, has noticed in some situations where their transmitter sounds better into a dummy load than into the antenna, then bandwidth issues in the antenna are likely the issue and we may be able to help. That's correct. Okay. Now let's talk about the RF amplifier modulator module. Um, what I really like about this module, basically, is the, the RF amplifier side is this side, and there's an H-bridge of four 200 ampere FETs there, and you can change them with uh, just a screwdriver. So um, gone are the days of having to haul out a big soldering iron and, and, and solder in one of these field effect transistors. It's just a, a screwdriver replacement of these FETs at some point in time. Yeah, that's right. They're very easy to replace, very few screwdrivers, very few screws to remove, really, and you can get right at them very quickly and efficiently. Now, the other thing that's interesting is, is this module only contributes 2.5 kilowatts per module to the transmitter output power, but it is actually rated for a 12 kilowatt continuous power rating. So a lot of overhead there. Yeah, that's right. These, these same FETs in the same configuration we have used in applications so with uh, power levels of up to 12 kilowatts continuous. And part of the reason we do that is because if you keep the transistors cool and you use a higher um, capacity device like the FET, then you have a reduced uh, uh, R value, on R on value is what they call it, I guess, or something, and, and therefore you have increased efficiency. So that's how we get to this remarkable 98% PA efficiency. Yeah, and every time I see that number, I like to point out that, that is not an that's not an aggressive number. It's actually a conservative number. We're a little bit better than 98% efficient um, okay. in the PA. And on this side over here is the modulator, and we'll go into a schematic diagram and show you what that looks like. So here's the RF amplifier stage. We've got the four, four field effect transistors that I mentioned here, 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 and here. And they're, they're arranged in a classic H bridge, and the RF power is, is, uh, is uh, taken off by a transformer on the output of, uh, of, of the uh, of the H bridge. And all four drive signals come directly from the exciter card. That's correct. Okay. Now the modulator, we've mentioned that the NX series uses nine phase PDM. And that nine phases means that each of the phases are offset 360 divided by nine degrees. And, and as a result, the the, there's a lot of cancellation of the of the noise that would typically be created by the by the, the samples, and as a result of this nine phases, the modulator filter can be very gentle and still have excellent out of band performance. That's correct, and you can see in this one module there are 
three phases, and that's how it's arranged. There's three in each module, and then uh, modules beside each other will be 40 degrees out of phase to um, so you'll see it'll add up to nine phases after you've run through three modules. So then these three phases are 120 degrees out of phase relative to each other. That's correct. And, and what that does is allows us to not have to worry about the fundamental PDM. We just have to start worrying about canceling the 3F PDM and 9F PDM. Um, so within the module where you might have needed notch filters or tighter bandwidth filters, those can go away. And, and those are a large part of the problem when you get looking into things like group delay or, or roll-off considerations and it provides a much more broad bandwidth modulator filter design. So this goes back to your, your comment earlier on that, that the transmitter was designed to be maximally linear and then we added the adaptive pre-correction. That's right. Just doing one or the other would be a band-aid and it wouldn't really be a full solution. So um, we believe that we've kind of started from the ground up and built something that can provide unsurpassed performance. Great. Okay. Let's look at the module, module from the side. Big heat sink over here doesn't run very hot. No, no, it doesn't. And most transmitters um, at normal temperatures, you're operating at like 35 degrees there. So the, the module itself is not getting hot. Okay. Another thing to mention about this amplifier is that there are no frequency adjustments. There's no other, no adjustments at all. No, and what I like to point out when we say that is the, the benefit that it is to cu customers that have multiple transmitters at different frequencies. Um, you can spare a single module, and you could use that to service NX25s, 50s, 100s, 200s, 300s, any NX transmitter um, and at any frequency. And you can just pop it right in, and immediately the transmitter will recognize the new module's serial number and will start talking to it. Um, so it's a very versatile solution in that regard. Okay. Let's look at it from the front panel. It's pretty simple. You've got an RJ45, which the drive signals come in on, and an LED that kind of gives you a front panel view of, of the health of the device. That's right. Okay. And as we said before, there's a nine phase digital modulator and a, the modulator bandwidth is 2.7 mega samples per second. Now all of those RJ45s that are carrying those RF and PDM drive signals come out of the exciter and come out of the, the, um, the controller card and then they come down to this distribution card, which is then routing the signals to all of the modules. That's correct. So there's a, there's a plug there for each module. And what we see on the right is a picture of the PDM drive distribution card. So on a distribution card, we would fa feed any number of phases in, and the appropriate phases would be routed to each of the modules. So on the front of each module, that jack would correspond to one of these jacks on the distribution board. Okay. Let's talk about the series combiner. It's, it's basically two parallel copper pipes with ferrite cores which couple the RF output. That's right. I mean, it's just a copper pipe. There are the ferrite cores that are hidden uh, in this picture. Underneath um, these shields underneath here. Underneath the shields. So the, the top of the shield is the return path, um, and the, through the center is the, the iron core. Now, the, the combiner itself looks slightly different if those of you that own an NX. You notice the combiner looks slightly different in this picture than it does in your variety, but it is quite similar. Okay. And this little relay here, which there's one for every module, is the only, is one of the only two moving parts in the NX series. The other's the fans. That's correct. That's correct. And as we mentioned earlier, this relay is the isolation relay to allow you to remove a module live. So that shorts out the combiner string, or, or, or the, that module's contribution to the combiner string, so that module can be removed without any ill effects. That's correct. Okay. This is the output network. These are the capacitors that are part of the output network. Now, the output network in the NX series is the only part of the NX series which is frequency specific. That is correct. And, and the inductors themselves are the same inductors for all frequencies. It's just moving the tap. Um, and as far as the capacitors, it's just either adding a few or taking a few capacitors out depending on the frequency. Um, and there is a spreadsheet that's available uh, as well as a procedure, but that spreadsheet outlines the capacitors that need to be installed for a given frequency and will tell you where you should tap on an inductor. It will say tap at two and a half turns in or so on. And, and you just count the turns. You use a screwdriver and you tighten it to the right place and that's how you um, would adjust the output network. for this. So just a few hours and they've changed the frequency of the transmitter really from one end of the band to the other. Now, granted, different parts may be required. They need some different capacitors. That's correct. Okay. So this shows those inductors we were talking about, and the taps are these, these taps here. That's right. Okay. But let's look at this same thing schematically. Here are the PAs, 
and then there's the, the combiner system, and this is really a pipe, really. It's not really a secondary to transformer, although it really acts like one. That's right. And then this is the output network right here, which is the twin T output network that you mentioned. Now, the thing that I find really cool about this is, is this, from this view, looking at how hard we try to protect the transmitter from lightning. There's a lot of things that go on. Not only do you have the lightning protection that exists outside the transmitter, the ball gaps or whatever, but as you come into the transmitter, the very first thing that you see is a series resonant high-pass filter section. And the reason for that is that lightning energy is basically concentrated below 100 kilohertz. And of course, the medium wave band is far above 100 kilohertz. Therefore, we can have a high-pass section and add basically a, a series resonant circuit, which, which acts like a high impedance to lightning and allows the, the, the uh, radio broadcast signals to go through without any problem. And in the midst of that, we have a, an adjustable carbon ball gap, which takes is a, is a relatively slow element but very high capacity. And then further down, further down through the circuit, isolated by time, and those inductors are represented by time, or represent time, is a much faster but more fragile device, which is a calibrated fast spark gap, which utilizes pressurized tritium in order to allow the gap to activate quicker. Is that right? That's right. And I think a few things that are worth pointing out here, um, you'll see that the gaps are placed very strategically at locations that give the amplifier a very generous load or a very kind load. So you can see when the gaps fire, um, they result in inductive loads, which the amplifiers do like. Um, some of the other things that you'll see as far as lightning protection are, we do have a directional coupler at the output of the transmitter. It's got two functions. One purpose is to, to provide the user a high quality power sample to drive a, a spectrum analyzer locally. The other reason for it is to give a very, very fast VSWR protection signal. This is set much beyond the, the 1.5 to 1 limit, and it's there just for a very quick shutdown, which is much under one microsecond, and it puts the PAs in a state where um, they shut off the amplifiers to provide a short to ground to shunt the lightning energy. Um, the other thing you'll see is at the input you have some voltage and current measurements at the input to the harmonic filter just above the PAs. Mm -hmm. Again, those are for to allow us to detect any faults within the filter um, to shut down the PAs. So, not well, for instance, if this gap were to fire right here, you'd see it as VSWR here. That is correct. Um, so anything that happens within the filter, um, you can have protection from without having to worry about things that um, can cause reliability issues like UV detectors and so on because we, we have our own VSWR protection in the transmitter. So what I hear you saying, Jamin, is that the very first way that a transmitter sees lightning before the high current and high voltage come through is it sees a VSWR change. That's correct. And in less than a millionth of a second, this transmitter is going to cause the transistors to protect themselves, to, to to, to stop operating and protect themselves. That is correct. And, and the transistors that we're using are quite, quite large transistors that have a very high joule rating. Um, so that's another step that is used in protection because of the rating of the transistors. So. Okay. Well, let's, let's see what these things look like. These are, the, these are actually carbon ball gaps. What is the advantage of a, of a carbon ball gap as opposed to the typical metal gaps we see? Well, to those of you that have done a lot of work at sites, you'll realize that the ball gaps, the metal ones, over time they do get pitted and they can get damaged. Well, the carbon gaps can handle a, a large number of events without ever um, seeing any pitting, so their effectiveness does not get diminished. Excellent. And this is the pressurized tritium fast spark gap. And then down here we've got the capacitors that are part of the um, uh, high pass stage. Is that correct? That's correct. And then here is a, a standard static drain choke. Okay. Now we also talk about protection as well on the AC lines. So we have MLB projection on the incoming state. First off, the main protection that we've got, and I think a lot of people are very sensitive to this, is that there's a transformer between the AC mains and every other part of the transmitter. That's correct. And, and that transformer provides a very, very um, beneficial thing. Because of the, there is a primary to secondary, the only way for the lightning to travel common mode through it is through the capacity from primary to secondary, which is um, fairly low. So if you insert movistors, it's a very easy way to shunt that energy to ground um, before it ever gets to the supplies, and it's a very effective 
Um, and we've got lots of information on it to, to show its effectiveness. And we've also got transient attenuator capacitors on the secondary of that transformer. Yep. And the AC surges are corrected by the phase control BP, B plus rectifiers in differential mode. That's correct. Okay. Let's talk about cooling. The, the transmitter actually, instead of one or more big, huge fans, has got a number of smaller fans which are in trays that pull out from the front of the transmitter. It can be replaced while the transmitter is running. That's correct. And these, these are very high quality fans which are ball bearing type and the typical fan life is over 11 years. And each of these fans has a tachometer which is monitored by the control system. So you can actually see the RPM of every fan from wherever you happen to be. That's right. It's not just locally, remotely, anywhere you are. So before you visit your site, you can have a look and say, well, it looks like fan whatever, B7, it seems to be spinning a little bit slow today. I'm not sure. Maybe something's going on. Maybe it's, it's starting to wear out. And that or maybe the air filter. Or maybe the air filter is clogged or, or something. So you can go to the site with a spare fan tray and maybe a spare air filter. And in this case, you don't need to bring a spare air filter, really, because our air filter is a metalized one that you can spray down with a hose. Take it out of the transmitter first, please. Please. Um, but you can spray it down with a hose and apply some new adhesive spray to, to make it as effective as possible. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Talk about the power supplies. It's a three-phase A uh, transformer, which brings a broad range of configurations through um, into the cabinet. And then the output side, the 250 volt side, is rectified through phase control, three-phase rectifier bank. That's correct. Okay, and that provides voltage control and soft start. And then we also have these large fuse banks, which protect um, banks of four modules. That's right. And then the filtering is done by these dual choke. Uh, capacitor input filters, or choke input filters with electrolytic capacitors in uh, uh, reservoir mode. That's right. And the picture I'll point out that you're looking at there is for an NX100. The NX50, there's a reduced number of capacitors, and they are pushed over to the side to allow room for the transformer. So this spot where these are right now would actually be occupied by the power transformer. That is correct. And then all the low voltage power supplies, the controller, the RF drive, and the fan supplies are completely redundant. That's correct. Okay. And those are those low voltage power supplies. That's right. Those are the 15 volt ones there. And this is the power transformer for an NX50. And you can see how you can change the taps depending on the AC voltage input. That's correct. Very easy just to take a screwdriver or a wrench and, and make an adjustment. Very good. Now let's talk about how the NX series handles digital. There's a lot of work that's gone into um, optimizing the linearity of the transmitter with the goal of having the best possible digital performance. So all of the NX transmitters um, uh, handle AM analog, of course, uh, via AES EBU inputs and left and right auto. It also has CQAM AM stereo built in uh, via AES EBU or left and right audio analog inputs. There's an HD radio model, which, which would then include an optional uh, XGen card, which is shown here. Uh, which is installed internally and feeds IMQ inputs directly into DNX. Is that, that's what you were talking about, wasn't it, where you were saying that the accuracy of the HD information as broadcast is improved when you use the IMQ feed. Well, that's correct. We're getting rid of processing stages. The IMQ feed is always needed, um, whether you're using our, our system or, or a different system. The difference is that IMQ in other systems gets converted internal to the um, HD exciter back to um, mag and phase, and then it goes to the transmitter, and the transmitter will, will have to do additional processing. So those additional processing steps um, cause extra um, lost information. So we skip that and go straight from INQ um, to, to our transmitter. Okay. And, and it, for those of you who live in parts of the world where DRM is an option, uh, there's an optional exciter which can be installed internally, and there's an external content server which, again, feeds the I and the Q inputs into the NX series. All right. Now let's talk about a little bit more about the HD radio. It's very simple to, to update the NX series to HD radio. The XGen card is installed internally and provides dramatically improved performance because of the direct input of the LVS signals directly to the exciter. Yeah, that's what we were just talking about. Yep. Getting rid of mag phase. And there are reduced adjustments. You don't have to adjust the mag phase amplitude adjustment anymore. That's right. It makes it much simpler when there's one adjustment that has to be made in order to optimize your performance. And to take it a step further, we can tell you what that adjustment should be within a very small window. So it's a matter of it gets shipped. It typically just works. You don't have to make an adjustment to get under the mask. 
And if you do, it takes less than a minute just to pop the number up a little bit or down a little bit. And look at the onboard spectrum analyzer. Um, it, it's interesting because the screen where you make the make phase adjustments in the transmitter, um, where you specify the delay, in that same screen it gives you a power display spectrum analyzer so you can see the results right away, right in front of you. Makes it simple. And then this is the exporter plus, which is the other part that's required. And this takes your audio inputs and, and, and feeds the transmitter. That's correct. Those audio feed inputs will feed your XGen card, and the XGen will then produce the INQ signals. All right. Let's talk about the control aspects of the, of the NX series. Um, the, there's a 17-inch color LCD screen, a wide range of configurable displays, uh, touch screen control or mouse keyboard. Uh, we have a network analyzer, a spectrum analyzer, complete monitor and control of all functions to the module level, logging of all functions, and then all of this is accessible by the web. So it's, it's very, very useful and, and, and easy to use. Let's talk about the specific uh, built-in instrumentation. The modulation monitors, monitors the positive and negative peaks as well as the average levels. We monitor the digital modulation, the IMQ levels, peak and average. The absolute modulation monitor, 0 to 100% of peak envelope. As again, the spectrum analyzer, which is based on a directional sample, real-time impedance analysis, digital carrier demodulation, pre-correction curves, extensive internal metering, in other words, all the voltages, currents, and drive levels at all levels, including the power modules. That's right. Everything that you would possibly want to get to, you can get at, not only standing in front of the transmitter, but you can see a log of it, and you can access everything remote controlled. So whoops, let's go back. Let's switch over at this point and actually take a look at an, an on-air transmitter as we speak. So now we've gone down into the lab, and we are looking at an operating NX50, which is being operated at 25 kilowatts because the load and the output network don't handle any more than 25 kilowatts. That's right. We've designed an output network that simulates an uh, antenna that provides about a 1.5 to VSWR at, five, um, at five kilohertz, 15 kilohertz. Sorry. Okay. So let's. This is the network analyzer, and we can see from that network analyzer the actual cusp here, That's which right. is actually as we speak on the air. Let's, let's look at that. Now, when I hit that button, that was the cue for our Ian Burns to call down to Javad down the test room, who is now going to be cranking on and adjusting that cusp. And pretty soon, maybe a couple of minutes from now, we're going to see that cusp start to turn. And we're in real time going to adjust the antenna characteristics of that. And we're going to be able to see the effect. Now, let's do one thing while we're looking at this. Let's zoom in on this and see this is actually a very accurate network analyzer. We can see that right now we're 9.09 .09 kilohertz below the, the cusp, or a bit below the carrier frequency. And we can see here the R and the X values. Uh, as we watch. And as this starts to change in a, in a few minutes, we're going to see uh, in real time the effects that it has on the spectrum analyzer. The interesting thing to point out while we're looking at this is, this is we're not having to do an audio sweep or something like that to gather this information. It's taking information from data that is already present in the audio. So when you're operating in HD mode, you're going to have about 15 kilohertz worth of information. So you're going to get plus or minus 15 kilohertz or 30 kilohertz of bandwidth worth of uh, data to rotate uh, or to view on the network. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's all live data um, that it takes right off of the uh, right off of the signal. I'll tell you a story. Years ago, uh, Jamin, and I was, I was at an NAB show, and I was demonstrating this exact functionality of, of being able to look at a real-time Smith chart with modulation and see and adjust it um, as, as to see what kind of performance I was actually getting out of my antenna. And, and as, uh, oh, it's starting to turn. Look at this. OK, so now I'm going to go ahead and drop this down. And let's watch our spectrum analyzer. You can see already that the performance of the spectrum analyzer, we are starting to go outside the spectral mask, simply because they've been readjusting the antenna's performance. And you can see he's going <laughs> quite a ways out there. And we're way outside the spectral mask now. That's right, and, and I, got, I got him to go quite a ways, and he's going to pause there for a second just so he can get a good look at um, what happens, then he'll, he'll rotate it back. But, um, so it's a combination of the fact that we have optimized for the, the network the way it was, but then it's not an ideal network, so you don't get as good performance when you rotate it. 
Sure. And every transmitter really has a sweet spot. This is the, 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 the arrangement of the impedance as, uh, as we modulate plus and minus to the carrier and, and how the, the transmitter sees that. And this sweet spot um, is, 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 a, is closer to 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock um, uh, in the direction. That's right. We're still doing a little bit of work on trying to determine what is the, the actual sweet spot. Is it actually 9 o'clock or is it slightly below that? And it's, it's appearing that it might be slightly below that um, for this system, and we've got some, some reasons why. So stay tuned for maybe a paper or something that might discuss that further. You can see here now we've returned that to the normal position, and now we are, as we would expect, to be way below the spectrum mask. That's right. Okay. One more thing I wanted to show here and let's see if I can bring this up. We actually have a constellation view um, in here. Is, or, is this going to work? Is yeah, that yeah, you're going to have to jump through. We see we're on, we're on subcarrier number one, okay, which is so on yeah, P, uh, um, uh, Okay. There's a... Yeah. All right. So now you can see, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you haven't seen a constellation view before, a better signal is is the, the dots are closer to each other. That's that, right. It's not a big fuzzy ball, it's a small fuzzy ball. It's less likely to have an error. Okay, okay. So that's what we, you know, if, if we were to spin the, um, the, the the cusp again, you might see these start to fan out a little you bit. You would, and you would. And if you hit plus a few times there, you'll see the QPSK carriers um, where they're, they're hot, this 64 signals rather than four, but. Okay, how far do I have to go out? Uh, you have to go around 15 or so. Okay. Forget which carrier it is. It's out there a little bit. Okay. This is pretty pretty advanced test equipment. We're actually demodulating there the you digital. Go. Yep. No. Yep. Okay. We're actually demodulating the digital carriers to see this. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Pretty cool. So this isn't the signal going out. This is the signal being picked up at the output of the transmitter and and being fed back in. One more thing I wanted to talk about, and it probably doesn't have too much application with, in some ways, but it does in others. Um, we have a built-in scheduler in the, in the transmitter, and what that scheduler allows you to do is to change presets based on a time of day and even a time of year. So you could set up your FCC schedule for the different uh, times of day that you have to go from one power level to another power level and things like that, and automatically load that all in here, and the transmitter is just going to do it. That's right. So that's, that's kind of cool, having that built in. Okay. And over here on the right-hand side, we've actually chosen some meters from the broad range of meters that we can look at. One of the things I've always enjoyed doing is this screen. This screen allows me to see the status of, of each of the... Well, let's see here. Uh, let's turn it back on there. Um, Did I turn that I turned off a module, didn't I? Right. How about that? Okay. So if you click on that same screen again, yeah. um, and just click up at the cubes, you can see all 20 cubes. That's what I was side. looking for. Okay, so that's the status, the, the voltage, the current, the PDM duty cycle, um, the low voltage supplies, uh, temperature, fans, all that for all of the modules in the transmitter at the same time. That's right. It's a very good health summary where you can see that everything's working. Um, as expected. Probably wouldn't want to look at that on my smartphone. <laughs> it might fill it up. Okay. So those, this is how we choose which meters we're looking at over here on the right-hand side. And right now we're seeing the controller ambient temperature, the DC current in the rack, the B-plus sample, 400 volts, rack 1, rectifier 1, uh, rectifier fan 1 speed, and the rectifier temperature. And everything looks like it's copacetic. That's right. Okay, let's switch back. Any other things you'd like to show while we're here? I think that's good for now. Okay, let's switch back to here. And just to show a couple of more things that we're working on, just to, sh just to explain that, that uh, not all work has, has finished. We're, we're, still, we're still thinking and still working. Here's a couple of new features that we're working on. This is AUI Anywhere. This is a a, 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 a program which allows you to, as one of these toolboxes, to monitor the status of other transmitters that you have configured uh, and paired with this transmitter. So, for instance, if your radio station group has a number of NX or NV transmitters or VS transmitters, you can display their health, AM or FM, 
um, on this screen, and you could click on them and see their AUI screen and simply communicate it through the Internet signals. And then down here we have our Orban Inside, an integrated audio processor which uses Orban technology and our DSP card, and it is controlled through the AUI. So you can adjust your audio processor uh, from your, from your um, uh, remote uh, location. Okay? Let's talk about the support. Every transmitter manufacturer lives and dies on support. We have three support offices, one located in Quincy, Illinois, one in Bangor, Maine, and another one in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We also have parts depots in Quincy, Bangor, Halifax, and Memphis. The Memphis one is quite interesting because it's right next door to the FedEx facility. So we can order parts as late as 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for overnight delivery so you can have the parts the next morning. We offer 24-7 live support. We have a live, live chat client on the web page. You can text talk to our engineers if you so choose. And it's probably important to note that unlike some of our competitors, Nautel has never stopped supporting a product. We've never withdrawn support of a product in our entire 40-year history of the company. And that's something that culturally we, we are very proud of within the company. I will mention that this is our 40th anniversary, and the gift is for you. And any NV or NX series transmitters purchased in 2009 will receive a five-year warranty at no extra charge. We also offer a number of financing options from 12 months same as cash to customized packages of up to 72 months subject to approval, and we accept trade-ins. So to summarize, the NX series is the most advanced AM transmitter series available today. It's available in power levels from 25 kilowatts to 2 megawatts with unparalleled efficiency. It's ready for all forms of digital radio, and it's complete with powerful test equipment. And what I'd like to well, – this is a nice picture. There's the sales crew from Nautel on a recent visit in warmer days. And this is the entire staff of our, of our Hackett's Cove, Nova Scotia factory. Uh, out celebrating and uh, saying how happy they are to have the NX series operating in the field. And here's how the, the crew and you, the people you can talk to with your questions about the NX series. Now what I'd like to do, speaking of questions, is I'd like to see if any of you have asked questions online here, so I'll expand. How does the ideal Smith chart cusp orientation compare with a Harris DX50? Uh, interesting question. Um, uh, most, most transmitter manufacturers are specifying at the PA um, the ideal cusp orientation is a parallel tuned orientation. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that the antenna configuration is going to be just right because the delay through the, that transmitter would be different than the delay through our transmitter in most cases. Um, but it wouldn't be a significant difference in delay. Okay. Uh, where can I find an explanation of I and Q signals? I and Q signals. Um, interesting question. Well. I, I don't know where to point you to the best place. Um, INQ is, is really just the baseband signal that will give you information when you've got um, stereo types of information. Rather than it being just analog AM, um, when it's INQ, um, you've got both the left and right information would be a good, uh, good place to look. But I mean, a lot of the basic, if you were to type it into Wikipedia and say INQ um, audio, it would give you some information there. Okay. As advanced as your transmitters are, do you foresee a day when you could diplex two stations inside a single transmitter? The biggest holdback for that is going to be the bandwidth of the um, the bandwidth of the uh, RF filter. Um, it's difficult because the RF filter has to to be able to uh, to um, allow for a signal signal to go through, and then at the same time, the big bandwidth of the modulator filter. Um, so the signals would have to be awfully close in frequency. To an effect, we do that um, in a small way when you're doing simulcast DRM or, or so on, some of these other technologies. HD radio is HD basically radio the same is thing. HD radio is doing the same thing. But when you're actually trying to separate the signals, um, trying to get the bandwidth required is difficult. Yeah. Okay. This gentleman is saying uh, one of his stations is on 1290, the other one's on 1400. That would be a challenge. That would be a challenge to try and get those both. Um, the, the bandwidth of the modulator, if you look there, you need, you need uh, over 100 and 150 kilohertz of modulator bandwidth to do that. So it would be a challenge, that's for sure. Not that it's outside the realm of possibility. I, I never say never because people said never for 90% efficient not more than two years ago. So. That's right. Okay, let's see here. Uh, more questions. 
If you don't have it installed already, will you have the built-in audio processing that you have as an option? Um, and can you expect uh, can you accept audio over IP? So that's that's a time we're working on it. Um, we're working on audio over IP. There's some cards that are in process, um, as well as the built-in audio processors and uh, upgrade kits will be able to be made available once some of that development is is completed. We're not there yet, but watch this space. Is additional software needed to access the NX over the internet or just a browser? Just a browser. That's all you need. Okay, that's easy. The only thing you're going to have to do is do the networking. So you have to open some ports and and make sure that, uh, and, and we tell you which ports to open, but that's all you need is a browser. As a sales guy, this next question tickles me. He says, do you accept trade-ins? Why, yes. Give us a call and we'll be happy to help. <laughs> <laughs> How about plans for transmitters with lower output level than 25 kilowatts? Uh, in the works. We're, we're thinking about it now. So it's... it's, it's the, the big question is, really, I mean, if you, these things like 17-inch LCD screens and all these things are not cheap, and it's easy to design, it's not easy, it's, it's possible to design them into very high power transmitters. There's a lot of other costs associated with it, but you get to a relatively low price, low power transmitter, it's harder to add all those overhead features in there and, and still be cost effective. Okay, let's see here. Um, out of the crate and connected, what is involved in the first time startup of NX50? Um, well, for those of you that have installed it, typically the installation is, is quite easy. It's a matter of pulling it out of the crate, crate plugging in the AC, plugging in your hard line, um, and then you pretty much just turn it on and, and let it go. One of the nice things is that Nautel actually sends you a technical questionnaire when you place the order, and you fill in there all the questions that, that we want to know, and when, when we get all those questions answered, we actually set the transmitter up the way that you're going to have it set up. So. It's really pretty much plug and play when you get it. That's right. I, I did miss one thing, which is installing the power transformer. There's some wheels, a kit, of, a kit that comes with the tra power transformer with some wheels, um, and you do have to roll that into place. There's another gentleman which has very kindly mentioned a particular competitor's brand that he'd like to trade in, and we won't go there, but thank you very much. We'd be happy to work with you on that one, sir. So uh, those are the questions that we had. If you have other questions, uh, email them to the email addresses shown on the screen here, sales at nautel.com, and they'll get to us, or you can contact your Nautel representative uh, in the United States or abroad, or you can contact me. And in the meantime, um, Jamin, I want to thank you so much for all the, uh, the interesting information. It's very exciting to, to present the NX series. It's a, it's a tremendous tool. I've been working with AM transmitters now for more than 30 years, and, and to see the revolution in these transmitters is awesome. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you for your questions. Come back for another webinar. Give us a shout. Let us know how you, we can help. Meantime, thanks very much, and goodbye from Halifax, Nova Scotia. <laughs>